Uh, Sunday morning, the 14th of January. It's just coming 25 to 9. You'll be able to pick it up this morning, fairly live at 9 o'clock. So good to be with you again. It's a pretty nice morning. It's mild, not too cold. Somebody said to give snow in this week. I'm not sure about that. But uh, it takes it a good wee while to get light these mornings. Half an hour ago, it was really dark, and then it sort of comes all of a sudden. So here you are. So glad I'm with you again. Thank you for allowing me into your homes and wherever you're listening this morning or through the week. Trust that the Lord would bless His word. We're continuing to do our studies, reaping in Revelation, and uh, we have come right through. We are looking this morning again at the great millennial kingdom. Of the Lord Jesus. You remember we saw in the sequence of events the Lord Jesus had come back again. The great tribulation period was ended and uh, it ended, culminated with the great battle of Armageddon. The Lord came uh, on the white steed, you remember, dealt with his enemies. The devil, uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet were put into the lake of fire. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. And the fowls of the air were filled with their flesh. Terrible ending to the battle of Armageddon. When we come into chapter 20 then, we're into his great millennial kingdom. The king has come back again. You remember we're looking at the A, B, C, D of the millennial kingdom. We looked last week at A for its arrival. And saw that there were certain things of course that had to happen. Uh, to be fulfilled before he came back again to establish his kingdom. There was, of course, the coming of the king in, in that great chapter 19 that we saw, and then the entering into the city and the binding of Satan that we look at, special reason for that, we look at in the coming Sunday all day well, the judgment of the living nations, the defeat of his enemies, and the establishment of his kingdom. All those things now are fulfilled, and now he comes to sit on the throne, in Jerusalem, in his great millennial kingdom. So let's take our Bibles and read the appropriate scriptures. We're looking this morning at the basis for the millennial kingdom, the great basis for it. We looked A for its arrival, now B for its basis, and we'll look at that this morning. Revelation chapter 20, and we're looking at the appropriate verses just for our study this morning. And John says in verse 4 of Revelation 20, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, those who had not worshipped the beast, nor his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And here's an important verse, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And shall reign with him a thousand years. Now there's one great verse that will lay the foundation for us this morning. And it's found in Isaiah's prophecy. And it's chapter 32 and verse number 1. Listen to what it says. Isaiah 32 verse 1. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness. Now the Lord give us good understanding of these verses and keep your Bibles if you have them or listen as I give you the verses and if you're taking notes you can look them up in your own time or if you're listening to it again then look up the scriptures because we haven't time in the half hour each morning to look up all the scriptures but I'll give you the references and you can certainly look them up for yourself. So a king who is the king? Well, the king's the Lord Jesus. Do you remember the usurper in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? You remember we saw that he usurped, he came, and he sat on the throne, the Antichrist, the devil's man. And he said, I am God, worship me. He was indeed a usurper. But here's the true king, the Lord Jesus. You remember Psalm 24, lift up your head, O ye gates. Be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this King of Glory? The Lord strong in battle. He is the King of Glory. So the King's the Lord Jesus, and He's coming to reign. You remember that great text in Psalm two and verse number six. Uh, God said, "I have established 
my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And God gave that great promise 3,000 years ago. And he has no, no, uh, he has no cause nor will he ever change it. A king shall reign in right. A king shall reign. Shall reign in his kingdom. And we are going to look at the kingdom this morning. You remember we saw that in Daniel's image, you remember chapter 2, was it last week or the week before, we looked at that great image and we saw the stone coming down, uh, cut out without hands. And you remember the stone smashed the, the image to smithereens and the stone had grew and grew and grew. And then it says in chapter 2 and verse uh, 35, And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So it fills the whole earth. There's a great reference to in the book of Ze Zechariah chapter 9. Uh, and it's to the same thing, Zechariah chapter 9 and verse number 10. It says this, And his dominion shall be from the sea, even to the sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Now I'm just showing you, just to establish the bounds of his kingdom. The stone became a great mountain, filled the whole earth. Zechariah says, from the sea and from the rivers right to the ends of the earth. So his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his kingdom is certainly a great domain. A king shall reign. The Lord Jesus is the king. He shall reign in his kingdom from the rivers to the ends of the earth in righteousness. Now we'll look at that in a moment or two when we come to it, because that's the great basis for the millennial kingdom is righteousness. Thousand years, of course. We saw that last year. Millie's a thousand and Annam's years. A thousand, a thousand years. Now, who, come, who is it that goes into this kingdom? We must establish that first and foremost this morning. Who comes into this kingdom? Well, we're going to see that Israel, of course, has a leading role in the kingdom. But all those who are redeemed, that's why I drew emphasis to that verse 6. Listen to it again. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Now you remember the Lord Jesus told us about two resurrections in John chapter 5. The resurrection to life and the resurrection to damnation or to judgment. Four parts in the first resurrection. Now listen to the verse. On such the second death is no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So all those who take part in that first resurrection will reign with Christ for the thousand years. You remember Christ, the first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15. Then the church, those who had died in the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then the Old Testament saints that will be raised at the coming of the King, Daniel chapter 12. And then, of course, tribulation saints as well that we see in a moment or two. So the church goes in. You remember way back, Many Sundays ago, many months ago, we looked at that great song of the redeemed in Revelation chapter 5. You remember it, don't you? Um, John says in verse 9 of Re Revelation 5, The church now home in heaven, and it says they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to loose the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and made us unto our God kings and priests, listen, and we shall reign on the earth. So the church is going in. We're coming back with him. We saw that in chapter 19. And we're going into his millennial kingdom, and we're going to reign with him. Oh, what a glorious kingdom it's going to be when we reign with Christ uh, in his great millennial kingdom. I think the church will have an administrative Rule, perhaps that's the verse that we read, started at in verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And maybe the church has an administrative rule in the millennial kingdom, but we're certainly going to live and reign with him. The Old Testament saints are going to be there. Jude, in his little book, gives us a great verse. Jude's the little book just before Revelation. And in verse 14 of his little book, just one chapter, and Enoch also the seven from Adam prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands 
of his saints. The Old Testament saints, the friends of the bridegroom, they're certainly going to be there and we're looking forward to seeing them and dealing with them. Tribulation martyrs. Now there's no doubt about that because this verse 4, look at it again. It says there, uh, those who had were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, the guillotine, back again in the tribulation period. And for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, nor received his mark upon their forehead, tribulation, martyrs, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So there's no doubt that they'll be there. And of course, those who had come through the tribulation period, who had, who had escaped death, and mind you, it wasn't easy to do that, because you remember when, when we looked at uh, uh, the tribulation period in the book of Revelation there, uh, we saw in chapter 13, you remember the beast and the false prophet, uh, he causeth all, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that is the second beast, the false prophet, that the image of the beast should speak, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, that no man, listen, might buy or sell, see if he that had the mark of the, or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So it wasn't easy to come through the tribulation period. So those tribulation martyrs and those who had come through the tribulation period, who had escaped death, they will go into his kingdom with them. And of course, the saved of the nations. You remember we looked at it in a wee bit of detail last week. In the judgment of the living nations, Matthew chapter 25, the sheep nations, they will go into his millennial kingdom with him. They are judged sec uh, uh, secondary, they are judged uh, individually, and they will go into his millennial kingdom with him. And of course Israel has a key role in the nation. Centre of the earth geographically and centre of attention nationally and centre of God's purposes prophetically and if we could read and you read it in your own time we haven't time to look at it this morning but read those chapters in Isaiah chapter 60, 60, 61 and 62 and you see the key role that Israel has to play in the millennial kingdom on Jerusalem remember please Jerusalem is going to be the capital city of the world what a place that is what a city it is and the Lord is going to reign in that city of your soul. So they're all going, all the redeemed are going to go in. All those who have part in the first resurrection, isn't that what it says in verse 6? Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. They shall reign with him a thousand years, right through the extent of his great millennial kingdom. So those are they who are going to go through and come through the tribulation period. The great basis of it, well, it's a theocratic government. It's a, a theocratic government, government based on righteousness. And um, God had always that intention, of course, that he would rule over his people. But sadly, they rejected him. If we went away back to 1 Samuel chapter 8, you would read there how Israel came to Samuel one day and they said, Now, Samuel, you're getting old and you're going on and you're slowing down, you know, and You'll not be able to do the things that you're doing now. Soon you'll have to stop and your sons aren't following in your pathway. That's interesting, by the way, and that's sad because oftentimes there are good men and their sons don't follow after. And Samuel was one of them. And you remember David had a rebellious son too. Maybe I'm speaking to someone this morning and you have a rebellious son or a rebellious daughter. Well, just keep praying for them. And pray that the Lord would touch them and bring them back into the ways of the Lord and the will of the Lord. So Samuel was grieved and the Lord said to Samuel, he said, Samuel, don't be grieved. He says, I haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. You see, God never intended, they said, we want a king to be like all the nations and God never intended his people to be like all the nations. They were a separate people. They were a special nation and God never intended them to be like the other nations. However, God gave them a king. And that king was Saul. And of course Saul failed, didn't he? Saul failed. Failed in his God's command. God gave him things to do and he didn't accomplish them. And he even went to the extent of 
going to inquire of a witch, a witch at Endor. And you can read the story in the book of Samuel, of course, and Samuel was brought back from the dead again to give him the message uh, that the next day he would die by the hands of the Philistines. And that happened at Mount Gilboa when we were there in 2022, just a couple of years ago. Uh, you wouldn't go now the way things are in Israel, but it was relatively peaceful then. And I was up at Mount Gilboa and we read the story of Saul and how the Philistines came and how he was slain and his son too uh, on Mount Gilboa. And you know, if there's one wee bright star in the reign of Saul, it was his son, Jonathan. And here's the interesting thing. You remember Samuel had sons who didn't follow after him. Well, here's a king who disobeyed God's command, but he had a good son. He had a son who followed after God. And Jonathan was a man of God in every sense of the word. And he was the bosom friend of David. There was no jealousy or spite in this man whatsoever. He was an exemplary figure, Jonathan. He was really the rightful heir to the throne. And yet he knew that God had chose David. And there was no jealousy. In fact, they were bosom friends. And you can read about them. And there's a lovely story, by the way, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, I think it is. It is 2 Samuel chapter 9. Uh, David came to the throne and he said, Is there any that I can show kind, any left of the house of Saul, that I can show the kindness of God to them? Listen, for Jonathan's sake. For Jonathan's sake. He never forgot the friendship and the bosom companionship of his friend of his friend Jonathan. So God raised up David and David was a shepherd boy and David became king, reigned for 40 years, 7 years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. And then Solomon came to the throne. I suppose the monarchy was at its zenith in the days of Solomon. But then Solomon failed too, of course, and got away from God. And you can read the story in the book of Samuel, how he got away and how his wives turned uh, his faith away from the Lord and he raised up all the idolatrous things. And it's terrible how far he got away. A man like Solomon, <clears throat> that we would count the, ma the wisest man that ever lived. He had a son called Rehoboam. You'll see where I'm coming to in a wee minute. Maybe we're going into too much history, but just to show you where we're going to in a moment. He had a son called Rehoboam, and he lacked wisdom too. And because of his lack of wisdom and because of the laws that he passed, the nation were split. Ten of those tribes followed Jeroboam and set up their capital in Samaria. And that's where the golden calf was set up. Terrible. Remember where the calf came from? Right back from the days of Erlen. Remember he set up that calf and they worshipped the golden calf. And It's terrible that the calf, the golden calf, the idolatry was set up at Dan and at Bethel. Bethel was the house of God. And the idolatry began there. In the house of God. Imagine. And then there were two tribes that followed Rehoboam. They went south and made their capital at Jerusalem. But in 722 BC the Assyrians came and carried the ten tribes away into Assyria. And then in 606 BC Nebuchadnezzar came with the armies of Babylon. And carried Judah and Benj Benjamin away to Babylon. And they were there for 70 years. But God's going to heal them. And that's why I was giving you a wee bit of that history. And you can read in Ezekiel chapter 37 the whole story. Let me just read a wee extract or two out of it for you just to show that God's going to heal them and bring them back into the nation, into uh, reign in his millennial kingdom with him. In Ezekiel chapter 37, God said to Ezekiel, he says, Son of man, prophesy. And he said the... Uh, from chapter 38, 37 it is. Uh, God said to Abraham, join the two sticks. He said, take a stick uh, and write upon it the name of Judah. And then take another stick and write upon it the name of Ephraim, the house of Israel. And join them both together into one stick. And they shall become one in the hand of God. And um, God says, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them, and there shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Now that's why I give you a little bit of the history. Maybe 
we went too far in the history of it. But it's interesting to see how God is going to bring them together again and how they're going to play a leading role in his millennial kingdom. So, a king shall reign. The king is the Lord Jesus. And he shall reign. His kingdom is going to be established. The church is going to be there. Old Testament saints are going to be there. Tribulation saints. Israel is going to play a key role. A king shall reign in righteousness. Now that's the great basis for the millennial kingdom. That's the be basis for the millennial kingdom. It's a theocratic government. A government ruled by a deity. This was what God always expected. That his son would reign. So the Lord is going to reign as the king. It's going to be a theocratic government based on righteousness. You see, the Lord Jesus, he's going to come as the son of righteousness. That's Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. He's coming back to this earth as the son of righteousness. He comes to the earth as the bright and morning star to take his church out. And then he comes to the earth as the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. That's Malachi Excuse me, chapter 4 verse 2. And then in Jeremiah 23 verse 6, one of his great titles is, Jehovah said, Can you the Lord our righteousness? And then we have seen, of course, that it's only the righteous who enter in. And then in Isaiah 1 verse 26, Israel, the city of Jerusalem is called the city of righteousness. The city of righteousness. And then... When you come to Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8, a scepter of righteousness. Now I'm just showing you how many times this great word crops up. The scepter of righteousness is a scepter of his kingdom. That's Hebrews chapter 1. You see, he died to put away what he hated, iniquity. And he rose again to establish what he loved, righteousness. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That's Hebrews chapter 1. So it's righteousness all the way through. Righteousness all the way through. This is the great basis for the theocratic government that's going to, be, to reign and the Lord Jesus in the throne of Jerusalem. A government by the a theocratic government based on righteousness. It's lovely to think, by the way, that you and I who are saved this morning, you and I who have put our trust and faith in the Lord Jesus, we are clothed in robes of righteousness. That's Isaiah 61 verse 10. Robes of righteousness and garments of salvation. I hope you have those garments on this morning. I hope you're saved. I hope you know the Lord Jesus as your personal saviour because when you put your trust in him he clothes you with robes of righteousness and garments of salvation a lovely verse 2 in 2 corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 it says us that he that is god has made him that is christ to become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of god in him believers when god looks at us he looks at us through christ not a wonderful thing oh i hope you're saved this morning I hope you're clothed in garments of salvation and robes of righteousness. If you're not, come and put your trust in him and have your sins forgiven. Now time's gone, but that's the great basis for his government. We have looked at A, its arrival, and now this morning we have looked at B, its basis. Its basis is, is righteousness. It's a theocratic government, government by a deity. The Lord Jesus is the king, and he's going to reign from the river to the end of the earth. The stone becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. He is the supernatural stone. He is the sovereign stone. He is the one that's going to reign. And he's going to reign in righteousness. Going to rule with a rod of iron. Now we'll see that next week. Next week when we come, we're going to look at the characteristics of it. Let's see. Because the Old Testament is absolutely full, brimming full of the great characteristics of the millennial kingdom now i'm going to give you some homework to do because you've got off very late this last few weeks with no homework so you're going to get some homework to do for next week i want you i, I intended to read this morning but we haven't time psalm number 72 all right psalm 72 now psalm 72 is the millennial psalm 
It's not mentioned in your New Testament at all. It's the psalm of the Millennial Kingdom. And as you read down it, take your red pen or however you underline your verses in your Bible and it's good to do that because then they stand out. And just underline all the times that this word righteousness crops up in these verses. So homework for next week, read Psalm 72 and then when we come next week we we'll look at the great characteristics, see for characteristics of his millennial kingdom. Okay? So have a good day and have a good week. And we'll see you all being well next week. Bye for now.